Hello friends, welcome to our channel. Today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The case of Sierra Lamar. The story begins in Fremont, California. Sierra Lamar's family consisting of her father Steve, a computer expert, her mother Marlene, and her older sister Danielle lived in Fremont. Sierra was born on October 19, 1996, while Danielle was around four years her senior. The family experienced some common ups and downs. It was later discovered that when Danielle and Sierra were younger, their father Steve had engaged in inappropriate sexual behavior with one of their school classmates during a sleepover. This led to his one-year imprisonment. Despite Steve's prior convictions, Sierra and Danielle said they got along well with him and that he had always been a kind and respected father. However, after the incident, Steve and Marlene decided to end their relationship. Marlene eventually decided to relocate from Fremont to Morgan Hill, a city located approximately 40 miles southwest of Fremont. She made this move together with Sierra and her boyfriend, Rick Gardner. Sierra was initially disappointed to be leaving her close friends and hobbies behind, but she eventually settled in at her new school, made new friends, and even rejoined the cheerleading squad. On March 11, 2012, Sierra called her parents in Fremont to update them on her progress. The discussion was mostly joyful as she was enthusiastic about one of her upcoming school tasks and mentioned wanting to get her hair colored. The next time she went to Fremont, she told her sister all about her homework. She was obviously doing quite well in her academics. Sierra ended the chat with Danielle and Steve shortly after dinner because it was a Thursday she had school the next day, and it was getting late. They all agreed to part ways for the evening and promised to speak again soon. However, none of them realized that this would be Danielle and Steve's final conversation with Sierra. February 16th, 2012, it was an ordinary work day back in Morgan Hill. The Gardner Lamar family got ready for the day as usual around six in the morning. Rick awoke to head out to work shortly after, and Marlene arrived to kiss Sierra on the forehead before heading out to work as well. Sierra had to get ready for school and lock the house. At this point, at 6.29 a.m., she texted a friend before putting on her shoes and walking out the front door to catch the bus. Pedo Hispanic Court was situated far from Sierra's high school and the rest of Morgan Hill. Sierra had to cross a deserted road between Palm and Dory Avenues every morning to catch the bus, just like many other children across America. While on her way at 7.11 a.m., she texted a friend to see if they could meet up before classes started. But when her school bus arrived at 7.15 a.m., just four minutes later, Sierra was not present. Sierra may have skipped class or even the entire school day because she didn't meet up with her friend. Her friends found it unusual that she didn't show up, but they didn't think it was wise to inform the school without her. The day proceeded as normal. Marlene routinely contacted Sierra after school to check on her, but found it unusual that her phone went straight to voicemail. However, she did not become worried. But when Marlene arrived home and saw that her daughter's room was still unoccupied, she realized that something was amiss. She contacted Steve to check if Sierra was planning to visit him in Fremont again. Unfortunately, this was not the case. When Sierra called Danielle and a few of her friends, they all left the same message. Marlene started to panic when she called Sierra's high school and found out that Sierra had missed all her classes. After calling the authorities, officers were sent immediately to Pedo Hispanic Court. However, since Sierra could have disappeared at any time, there was no clear starting point for the investigators. Those closest to Sierra, including several of her friends, were questioned first, and they were all very honest about the predicament that Sierra and her family were facing. Even though she was usually content, it had only been a few months since her mother's divorce had compelled her to leave her family and all of her old friends behind. Authorities believed that because she frequently made lighthearted and even serious comments about returning to Fremont, she had most likely left voluntarily. Despite the fact that the police downplayed Sierra's disappearance, other factors were moving in the exact opposite direction. 
She not only said nothing, but she also stopped posting anything to her social media accounts. She never arrived at the front door, her phone was off, and all calls went to voicemail. Naturally, Sierra's loved ones and friends were terrified, thus the massive search for Sierra Lamar got underway. Despite the police's ineffective attempts, the trail of evidence related to Sierra's disappearance is currently one of the longest, most intricate, and most fascinating cases I've ever covered. The investigation began on Sunday morning, two days after she vanished. Data forensics were examining the previous data from her phone when they discovered that it had sent a signal without any electrical activity in the middle of the night. The phone appeared to have been turned on briefly before being turned off again, and the coordinates on the phone led them to a field near Sierra's house. At dawn, a search team carefully combed through the fields where the phone had been detected, and after just a few minutes, they found it. The Samsung Galaxy that Sierra had been using was located near the road, and it had sustained significant physical damage. It was assumed that her phone had likely been thrown off the road. Investigators concluded that she had not turned on her phone that evening. Instead, they reasoned that the rain had caused a false signal, briefly activating her phone. What a fortunate coincidence. This was the conclusion of the story which heavily relied on the authorities finding the woman's phone. The events that occurred were caused by a raindrop and a short circuit. Given the nature and circumstances of the case, the detectives found the possibility of the woman's phone being thrown from a moving vehicle to be particularly concerning, considering the lack of footprints, tire tracks, or any other visual evidence. The next day brought about yet another horrifying discovery. Two kilometers from Sierra's house, a search crew found her backpack thrown just outside a barn. She had expected to go to school and was probably pushed away from her own essential items, as the bag included her schoolwork, inhaler, and money. Sadly, things only get worse from here. Additionally, a complete outfit, possibly the one she was wearing the morning she vanished, was found in her luggage. This ensemble included her pullover, pants, socks, shoes, and even undergarments. Her outfit was subjected to DNA testing, and the results were revealed. Her pants contained male foreign DNA, which suggested that she had likely been assaulted. Although the search had already intensified significantly in the days following Sierra's disappearance, the discovery of her phone and clothing sparked a fresh outpouring of local and international sympathy. Authorities received more than 1,000 fresh tips, and officers worked more than 7,000 hours. Several search teams were composed of more than 800 people. They examined every available lake and reservoir in the area, methodically combed over fields, and looked inside abandoned buildings. Sierra's name was a hot topic in the community, and posters for missing people were put up all over the place. Additionally, Sierra's parents offered a $10,000 reward to anyone with credible proof. However, despite their best efforts and those of the community, only a golf ball and a flipper were discovered. Investigators were closing in on a culprit, though the public was unaware. Twelve days after Sierra's disappearance, DNA on her pants matched a local man. All 57 registered sex offenders in the area were investigated, and Sierra's father was quickly eliminated as a suspect. Anlin Garcia Torres, a 21-year-old man with a troubled past, emerged as a suspect after a successful DNA match. The suspicious relationship between Sierra and Anlin caused detectives to place him under constant watch. Nobody knew if Sierra was still alive or not, but Anlin was the most likely to know at this specific moment. The officers thus took a number of steps to keep an eye on his whereabouts and means of communication. His phone was tapped, a GPS tracker was covertly placed in his car, and two undercover police investigators shifted into an RV next to his house. After finding that the RV park had cameras at the front door, investigators also started looking through security footage from the neighborhood around Anlin. They examined this film on the day of her disappearance to determine whether Anlin had left or arrived home. At 7 a.m. on the morning Sierra vanished, Anlin's travel time of seven miles from his home to Sierra's 
was a perfect match for the period during which Sierra could have been kidnapped, even though Annalyn had departed for work at his normal time. Safeway's shift records showed that Annalyn did not show up for work on March 16th. When his management inquired further, they discovered additional unfavorable information about Annalyn. It turns out that just three years prior, three unsuccessful kidnapping attempts had occurred in this Safeway's parking lot. Thankfully, none of the perpetrators were ever formally recognized or detained. The only piece of evidence from each of these attempted kidnappings was a taser that the perpetrator had dropped. One of its batteries had a fingerprint on it, however, it was only a partial fingerprint, and only a direct one-to-one -one comparison could match it. The theory of Annalyn being the suspect seemed plausible, but when Annalyn's fingerprints were compared to those on the taser, a startling realization emerged. In reality, Annalyn was the suspect. The suspect was now in the hands of the investigators. He was positively identified as being present when Sierra vanished. His DNA was discovered on her pants, and he has a history of involvement in kidnappings. This was sufficient to detain him, question him, and seize his automobile for DNA testing. In spite of Annalyn's arrogance during the interview, the test results were unfavorable for him. He stated that the day Sierra vanished, he went fishing, that he had no idea who Sierra was, and that he was certain they would not discover anything. However, Annalyn did not end his interview before making a very peculiar revelation. Annalyn admitted to having the somewhat vile habit of masturbating while driving and disposing of the used tissue out the window. Additionally, he asserted that he had tossed out a used tissue in the precise spot where Sierra's bag was discovered on the morning she vanished. The cops didn't believe his absurd explanation. Annalyn Garcia Torres was formally detained on May 21, 2012, in connection with the disappearance of Sierra Lamar outside of his place of employment in a Safeway parking lot. This resulted from a number of distinct linkages between Sierra and Annalyn's vehicle. Her DNA was found on the interior door handle of the car's rear door, according to a DNA examination. Additionally, fibers from Annalyn's car seats matched those found on Sierra's clothing, and a piece of rope discovered inside his car included a hair strand from Sierra. This proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that she had been in his car at some point. But even after his arrest, the situation still had a serious flaw. Even though it might have looked evident what had happened to Sierra, her body had yet to be discovered. Could they really accuse Annalyn of first-degree murder in the absence of a body or a death that had been verified? Yes, in reality. Santa Clara County District Attorney Jeff Rosen said on May 19, 2014, that he would be requesting the death penalty against Annalyn, although Annalyn had previously entered a plea of not guilty to killing Sierra. There was little to no room for error given the overwhelming body of evidence that pointed to his guilt. All the way to the end, after being delayed, Annalyn's trial finally got underway on January 30th, 2017. The trial was drawn out and stressful for all parties, with long arguments from the prosecution and defense during the more than 13 weeks of testimony. The defense team for Annalyn tried to argue that his exposure to pesticides from surrounding fields as a child may have psychologically affected his cognitive capacities, and therefore, the crime was not his fault. They considered this to be an interesting aspect of the trial. Additionally, they argued that he shouldn't be eligible for the death penalty because he had nothing to do with the toxic exposure. And under those circumstances, they claimed that this was a deficit he faced, which other people did not. In a last-ditch effort, Annalyn's defense team asked for a new trial after casting doubt on the reliability and honesty of the chief investigator and asserting that he had tampered with evidence in the past. This motion, though, was turned down. The jury convicted Annalyn Garcia Torres of Sierra Lamar's first-degree murder. On May 9, 2017, the evidence was so overwhelming against Annalyn that he was unable to escape responsibility for his acts, even though Sierra's body has never been located and her death has not been proven. Sierra's mother addressed him directly in court and declared, 
I find it inconceivable to do a horrific, violent crime. You have hurt both our family and your family deeply. You have taken away from Sierra what God has in store for her, but you also have the option to repent and let us know where she is. I often reflect on her and what has been taken away from me as a mother. Simply put, it's difficult to accept that this took place, though it's reality. I still assume it's a dream when I wake up every morning. As numerous of Sierra's kin read letters to him in the courtroom, and Alan remained quiet and motionless, and he has continued to insist that he is innocent. It follows that he has never said where Sierra's body might be, and regrettably nobody knows what exactly happened to her on the day that she vanished. Outside the evidence offered, Annalyn was formally given a life sentence without the possibility of parole after being spared the death penalty. Since his sentencing, Annalyn has remained largely silent and, despite receiving hundreds of letters from news organizations and total strangers, has only answered one letter. In this letter, Annalyn wrote, I maintain my innocence and I'm not going to discuss the matter. This letter is sent to a news reporter from Crone 4. I do not trust the news as there is a lot of selective reporting that presents an often inaccurate picture. Like many others, I believe everyone has a right to be heard, but sadly, those times are long gone. Actually, I'm not sure why Annalyn continues to maintain his innocence, as this is as obvious as day because of his DNA on Sierra's possessions, Sierra's DNA in his car, his prior criminal history, and a precise timeline. At least it was crystal clear that he was involved in Sierra's disappearance. There is no way she would still be missing if she were still alive, claimed friends and family. Over a period of three years, volunteers carried out over 100 searches within a 15-meter radius, putting in a combined 50,000 man-hours of search effort in search of any information about the missing young woman. Even now, volunteers continue to search desperately for Sierra Lamar. The majority of them are aware that Sierra is probably deceased, but they still want to return her to her family and provide them with the closure they need. Nobody is certain where Sierra's body may be at this time, but hopefully, one day the Lamar family will receive the closure they seek. Where does the line lie that once crossed, there's no return? How does an ordinary woman transform from a loving wife and beloved mother into a cruel murderer capable of dividing a nation into two opposing groups? And how does her name become a constant topic among locals and newspaper headlines for years? Roxana Valdez could answer this question. Murderers don't stand out in a crowd, are not recognizable during dinner, and might even live under the same roof without revealing their true nature. They are indistinguishable from those who never cross that line. Thus, no one could have imagined what Roxana did on that spring evening of April 5th, 2014. And when they found out, they simply couldn't believe it. But let's start from the beginning. Little is known about Roxana's past. Despite the efforts of many Chilean reporters who competed to tell her story, they could find almost nothing about her. The only information from her criminal file was sparse. Born in a small village in the province of Punta Arenas, Chile, in 1957. That was it. Perhaps the lack of information was due to journalistic ethics, as the locals, known for their fiery temper and unique customs, might have retaliated against Roxana's relatives for her crime, potentially turning their lives into a living hell. Roxana Valdez was married to a man whose name, for reasons unknown, remains either undisclosed or unknown to the press. She had a son with him. It's clear that her marriage wasn't the dream every girl hopes for, as the couple eventually parted ways in 2011. As a single mother in a small village where jobs were scarce, Roxana faced significant challenges. In such communities, the primary occupation was growing and selling fruits and vegetables. Even the local educational institutions focused on agriculture. It was in this setting that Roxana found employment at the Don Gregorio boarding school, which trained students to become agricultural technicians. She worked as a night supervisor at the school, ensuring that students slept at night and did not engage in unruly activities. Her responsibilities didn't include the actual upbringing of the children. Roxana's son also attended this boarding school as she worked in the fields during the day and couldn't give him the attention he needed. At the same boarding school where Roxana worked, 
Claudio Munoz Ramirez held the position of head of grounds maintenance. His duties often required him to work during the night, which is how he came to meet Roxana. Despite being 14 years younger than her, they found much to talk about. Roxana would spend entire nights discussing school affairs and her own failed marriage with Claudio. They had common ground in their personal lives as well. Claudio had two daughters whom he adored, but felt disconnected from their mother, contemplating divorce several times. However, he remained in the marriage due to a promise he had made to her late father. Over time, Claudio seemingly forgot his promise and began spending his free time with Roxana away from his family. Eventually, he made a decisive move. Without explaining himself to his wife, Claudio gathered his belongings and left their home. It was clear he went to Roxana, who happily welcomed him into her life. Their relationship progressed rapidly and effectively. Roxana led into her home a man she barely knew, with whom she had only enjoyed nighttime conversations. She seemed to overlook the fact that there were children around needing constant attention. Amidst these enjoyable and heartfelt talks, Roxana failed to notice Claudio's true nature. He was, in reality, quite temperamental and sometimes even cruel. However, it was perhaps too early to judge who was more cruel between the two. The first serious outburst of aggression from Claudio took place within the walls of the boarding school. On a scheduled community cleanup day, students were assigned different areas to tidy up. Brooms, buckets, dustpans, and rags were distributed. Everything needed for a thorough cleaning as often happens, some students protested and refused to participate. Claudio, responsible for cleanliness but lacking any teaching experience, became infuriated with these students and threatened that, in the absence of teachers at night, he would beat anyone who didn't participate. Whether he would have followed through on this threat is unknown, but the students eventually started cleaning and later collectively complained to the principal about Claudio's threats of physical violence. The principal, displeased, asked Claudio to submit a voluntary resignation. It's important to note that the Don Gregorio boarding school was practically the only place in the area offering stable and reasonably paid employment. Claudio spent some time looking for work in fields and at fruit bases, but when it became clear his efforts were in vain, he and Roxana decided to seek a better life elsewhere, leaving her son in the boarding school to continue his education. They deemed it too risky to embark on this venture with him. To avoid dependency on employers, having been burned once already, the couple decided to start their own small business, a fruit kiosk. They moved to a favorable location, the commune of Molina, a couple of hours' drive from the Chilean capital. This place is well known for its vineyards, producing renowned wine brands exported worldwide. Roxana and Claudio purchased a kiosk near their new home, found suppliers for vegetables and fruits, and made their first steps in their small family business. Claudio handled the purchasing and transportation of the products from suppliers to the kiosk, while Roxana was in charge of sales throughout the day. Hiring an employee wasn't feasible, as it would mean additional expenses. Moreover, they feared that an employee might not monitor the perishable goods closely enough, leading to further losses. Claudio was visibly upset and even angry when he found out that Roxana was expecting their first child together. Perhaps it was a moment that required serious reflection, but Roxana, perhaps blinded by her new relationship and their flourishing business, didn't oppose her husband's view. She agreed that once the child was born, they would soon hand it over to her relatives for upbringing. However, it turned out there was no child to give away. Since that time, Claudio's behavior changed drastically. He often yelled at his wife and sometimes even resorted to physical violence. Neighbors from nearby houses, unhappy with their noisy new neighbors, witnessed this behavior many times and often called the Chilean police, the Carabineros, to intervene and calm the domestic disputes. On one occasion, when the Carabineros arrived in response to a call, they witnessed Roxana, in tears and almost half-naked, running out of the house followed by Claudio. Roxana confessed to the officers that she was a victim of systematic domestic violence, which had led to a miscarriage. She even required psychological help after the incident. However, as time passed, the grievances were forgotten, and the troubled couple, as if nothing had happened, continued to live together as before. Following the incident, Claudio should have faced criminal charges, but a compassionate Roxana decided to give him another chance. 
extracting a promise that it was a one-time occurrence. Claudio vowed never to repeat such behavior, but his past actions with his ex-wife suggested his words might not hold much weight. Unfortunately, history repeated itself. Claudio temporarily ceased his physical abuse of Roxana but developed a habit of leaving home at night to drink heavily in local bars. He spent considerable amounts of their family budget not only on alcohol, but also on local women of ill repute. Roxana endured her husband's behavior, believing that Claudio would settle down once they had a child together. In a sense, she was right. In 2013, Roxana gave birth to a healthy child. Claudio stopped his carousing and fully immersed himself in their business, which now needed to expand. They purchased another kiosk in a neighboring area and another vehicle for product transportation. Roxana also invested in firearms for protection as they lived and worked in less safe areas. The family's wealth increased significantly, but only on paper. Claudio reverted to his old ways, squandering money on drinking and again resorting to domestic violence against Roxana. In Roxana's testimony, she recounted the escalating abuse in her relationship with Claudio. Initially, Claudio's drinking was infrequent, but it soon increased in frequency. He would come home inebriated, accusing Roxana of imagined infidelities, leading to physical and sexual abuse. Despite her pregnancy, Claudio's actions seemed deliberately harmful, culminating in a miscarriage in August 2012 that plunged Roxana into a lengthy depression. One night, following his usual pattern, Claudio went out to a local bar and did not return home until the next morning. Roxana, used to his behavior, still worried about him. It turned out that Claudio had stolen 5 million Chilean pesos, about $6,000, which Roxana had from selling her mother's house to spend on alcohol and brothels. This betrayal shocked Roxana, as the money was for their shared business and was hidden in their daughter's room. When Claudio finally returned home late that evening, Roxana confronted him about the missing money. Uninterested in discussing, Claudio hit her and admitted to squandering all the money. This was the last straw for Roxana. Without a word, she went to their bedroom, retrieved a revolver intended for protection against local criminals, and shot Claudio in the chest. He died instantly, surprised by her drastic action. Roxana, equally shocked by her own actions, attempted to stem the bleeding from the fatal gunshot wound, but it was too late. The close-range shot from a .38 caliber bullet was fatal. Roxana's desperate act marked a tragic culmination of ongoing domestic turmoil. Roxana's testimony reveals her profound remorse and recognition of the immorality of her actions. She confesses that when she went for the revolver, her intention was not to intimidate Claudio but to kill him. She recalls the countless times Claudio abused and assaulted her, and her failure to report him to the authorities, or retract her complaint out of fear. She feared being alone even before they had a child together. After shooting Claudio, Roxana's immediate concern was the potential impact on their daughter, especially if Roxana were imprisoned and the child sent to an institution. That night, Roxana decided that the best way to deal with the situation was to dispose of the body and report Claudio missing, aware that his frequent disappearances during drinking binges were known to the police. Disposing of the body was a daunting task for Roxana, a delicate woman. She decided to remove it piece by piece. First, she used kitchen knives intended for meat cutting to sever the limbs and head. This process required five knives, as they kept dulling. Then she boiled the dismembered parts in the largest pots she had, all while playing with her young daughter, who was oblivious to her mother's actions and her father's fate. Roxana's calculated approach to disposing of the body while maintaining a semblance of normalcy for her daughter, highlights the complexity and desperation of her situation. The day after cooking and cooling the body parts, Roxana packed them into plastic containers, organizing them separately, hands, legs, head, and torso. Each container was then placed in a garbage bag. She loaded them into her car and headed to St. Lucia to scatter the bags on a vacant lot. Before leaving, she thoroughly cleaned her house with bleach, However, once in St. Lucia, she couldn't muster the courage to dispose of the bags from her car, despite finding a suitable spot. In her testimony, Roxana expressed her internal conflict. It's strange, I had the bravery to commit this heinous crime, 
and dismember a human body as if it were a piglet, but I couldn't bring myself to dispose of the evidence. I was nervous throughout the drive, feeling constantly watched, fearing that police would stop and search my car at any turn. This fear led to panic, even though I had a backup plan involving my daughter, pretending to rush her to the hospital if stopped. I even thought of how to pinch her to make her cry louder. Unable to discard the remains, Roxana returned home with them, hiding the bags in the garage. She cleaned her car's interior with bleach again and visited Claudio's relatives, claiming that he had stolen a large sum of money and hadn't been home for days. They merely shrugged in response. She then visited her mother and brother. Her mother was extremely worried about Roxana's behavior. She was not eating, had a glassy-eyed look, and repeatedly asked the same questions. The only question she answered promptly was about Claudio's absence, saying he went to buy goods for their store, but had a flat tire and got delayed. Returning home and alone with her thoughts and the hidden evidence, Roxana broke down. She called her brother for help. When he arrived, she confessed everything and showed him the containers. Naturally, her brother was in shock. When Roxana called her brother, she wanted to vent and share the nightmarish years she endured with Claudio. But above all, she needed his help to get rid of the containers holding the body. However, her brother refused, fearing police involvement and the possibility of being charged as an accomplice. He urged her to confess to the Carabineros, Chilean police, insisting he would do it if she didn't. Disappointed but realizing she had no other choice, Roxana complied. That night, Roxana went to the fourth police station and announced her intention to make an important statement. The officers, familiar with her, initially thought she wanted to report her troublesome husband. However, they were shocked by her confession. Roxana was immediately arrested. The news spread rapidly throughout the area, attracting countless journalists around the station. They waited eagerly to photograph Roxana as she was let out, hoping to capture a few images and, if lucky, ask her and the officers some questions. As the journalists waited, Roxana was eventually brought out. Handcuffed and in distress, she exclaimed, I was afraid he would kill me one day before being escorted into a police car. The case seemed straightforward. Roxana had confessed, provided evidence, and voluntarily surrendered. However, prosecutor Monica Ballesteros wanted a deeper investigation. Skeptical of Roxana's easy confession, she requested an extended arrest to conduct a forensic examination. Ballesteros aimed to prove that Claudio was still alive during the dismemberment, which would significantly increase Roxana's sentence. The judge granted a 60-day detention for further investigation. Meanwhile, Roxana's attorney, Carolina Gutierrez, argued that Roxana acted under extreme emotional distress, possibly exacerbated by postpartum depression and chronic domestic abuse. She emphasized Roxana's cooperation and voluntary confession as mitigating factors. However, the prosecution's theory that Claudio was alive during dismemberment crumbled after forensic results. It was confirmed that Claudio died from the gunshot wound to the chest. The bullet from the .38 caliber revolver caused a heart rupture and damaged vital organs, disproving the prosecution's initial hypothesis. Given these developments, the aggravating circumstances were dismissed. Another lawyer, Juan Pablo Cardenas, who sought to make a name for himself in this high-profile case, pointed out that the firearm used in the murder was legally registered. He also noted that Roxana's first report of domestic violence to the police was filed just 20 days after the couple started living together. Psychologist Rodrigo Valenzuela, after a medical examination, submitted documents to the court indicating that Roxana was extremely mentally unstable at the time of the crime. This meant she wasn't fully aware of her actions and her emotional instability was linked to the loss of two children, one in August 2012 and another just three weeks before the crime. Furthermore, a forensic examination requested by the prosecutor revealed that Claudio had a high blood alcohol level of three grams per liter at the time of his death. On April 17, 2015, after a year of various examinations, investigations, and evidence gathering, Roxana's trial began. The media, often sensationalizing tragedies, dubbed the case the Molina Cooks case, alluding to Roxana's dismemberment and boiling of her former husband. Some unscrupulous journalists seeking to attract attention to their publications even fabricated stories that Roxana had eaten part of the remains. 
although this was merely a product of their imagination. Roxana, aware of the media portrayal and deeply distressed by it, refused to make any statements during the trial. The prosecutors tried to influence the judge by emphasizing that Roxana committed a grave crime by Chilean standards, patricide. However, they couldn't prove that the murder was premeditated. The defense attorney, in turn, argued that his client acted in self-defense, protecting herself from a brute who had brutally mistreated her for years. The court hearing lasted several weeks, and during this time, the entire population of Chile followed the case closely. Prosecutor Monica requested a 15-year prison sentence for the accused. However, the judges, having carefully listened to the defense and the jury's opinion, sentenced Roxana to six years in a correctional facility with a lenient regime. Claudio's relatives, who understandably wished for a life sentence or even execution for Roxana, and were already protesting when they heard the prosecutor asking for only 15 years, were utterly dismayed by the actual court decision. They tried to deny any violence in the family and argued that Claudio, being a businessman and financially independent, could not have stolen $6,000 from Roxana they also claimed that Claudio had confessed to them that Roxana often took out the revolver from the closet and told her husband that she would kill him one day. Claudio's sister, in an interview with the press, even tried to blame Chile as a state, arguing that it's a country where there is no justice and the judicial system is utterly corrupt, given that such brutal criminals are given such short sentences, comparable to minor robberies. Even Giselle, Claudio's first wife, defended her ex-husband assuring everyone that there couldn't have been any violence from Claudio's side. She had lived with him for many years, and during all that time, he never dared to lay a finger on her. Meanwhile, Roxana often caused disputes, motivated by her jealousy and possessiveness. Regarding Roxana's subsequent imprisonment, she spent only two-thirds of her sentence in the colony before being transferred to a semi-open education center in Talca for good behavior, Roxana was allowed to communicate with her daughter and was eventually released early. The press, of course, stirred up public interest in this case again, and the public was extremely outraged that the cook from Molina was released early. However, there were also those who, although considering Roxana a murderer, still justified her actions, seeing her as a victim in the whole situation. The debate over this case continues in the country to this day. Overall, this story highlights the grave consequences that can result if domestic violence is not addressed at early stages. On Monday, September 17th, 2018, in Ames, Iowa, the weather was warm and clear. That morning, Celia Barkin Arroyna, 22 years old, decided to head to Coldwater Golf Links Club to play golf before her university classes. On her way there, she chatted with her mother. Her mom, sensing something might be off, asked if everything was okay and safe on the course. Celia confidently assured her that she was perfectly safe and that there were plenty of people around. Sadly though, as it turned out, no place is entirely safe. Soon after arriving at the course, this talented athlete became the victim of a terrible crime. Celia was born on July 6, 1996, in Point San Miguel, a village in Cantabria in northern Spain. Her family had lived there for eight generations. She moved to Iowa thanks to an athletic golf scholarship. Offered many choices by various universities due to her talent in golf, she ultimately chose Ames, Iowa, a quaint town of 65,000 people reminding her of home. Her family remained back in Spain. Her parents, Maria Arusa and Marcos Barkin, had two children, Celia and Andres. Her father worked as a butcher her mother initially worked as a salesperson in a clothing store, but became a housewife after having children. Though they weren't wealthy and led modest lives, the family was tight-knit and determined to provide a good education for their children. Andres went to law school while Celia's success in golf earned her the scholarship to the United States. Celia's love for golf came from her mother who loved the sport when she was young herself. Even though Celia was smaller than other girls her age, she adapted by using specific techniques to win. Celia's story is one of talent and promise cut tragically short. She sought opportunity far from home, only to face an unimaginable end in what seemed like a safe and peaceful refuge. When the girl grew up, she was petite and worked tirelessly on her game. 
Considering her short stature, she dreamed of becoming a professional and successful golfer, not for popularity, but out of sheer determination to succeed in the sport. She wanted to make life easier for her parents. The girl constantly spoke about buying them a house and taking care of them. For this purpose, Celia practiced diligently to achieve excellent results. Throughout her career, Celia received many titles and awards. She won victories in various competitions. Specifically, Celia secured the European Women's Amateur Championship in Slovenia in June 2018. She finished second in the Women's Team Golf Competition in Europe and was the 2018 Big 12 Women's Golf Champion in the United States. Additionally, she was named the 2018 Iowa State Athlete of the Year. Given these achievements, there were high expectations for her future. When Celia moved to the United States, her relationship with her family remained strong. She communicated with her parents daily, sometimes even four or five times each day when she had free time. Celia missed her family deeply. A nightly call before bed to say goodnight and share daily successes became a cherished ritual. During vacations, she would visit her family in Spain and continue training hard to improve her skills during these visits. Her mother supported her passion and trained alongside her. Celia settled well in Iowa, where she lived with her boyfriend Carlos Negri Nobilis in a rented apartment. Their relationship has an intriguing history. When Celia and Carlos met at university, she was dating another individual at that time while Carlos fell for her instantly. Her charming smile, piercing gaze, cheerfulness and kindness captivated him, while her determination earned his respect. Despite his feelings, Carlos accepted that Celia was with someone else but became her best friend and steadfast supporter for over a year until she eventually became disillusioned with her boyfriend and ended the relationship. Carlos finally confessed his feelings during one of their walks. Celia, pulling him by his shirt, kissed him and without a word, drove away in her car. Carlos was overjoyed that she felt the same way. He ran around the dormitory screaming with happiness. That's how their romance began. To celebrate this new chapter, Carlos set off fireworks to impress Celia. He even sent her a video where he confessed she was incredible and one in a billion. After that, they were inseparable. They moved in together and started sharing their lives. Lately, their conversations included dreams about their wedding and even potential names for their future children. By May 2017, they were engaged and preparing for the biggest event of their lives. That same year, Carlos graduated with a college degree and secured a position at an engineering firm in Ames. Celia was finishing her last semester at Iowa State University, majoring in civil engineering as well. After ending her athletic career, Celia dreamed of being an engineer to benefit others. She wanted to show that women could succeed in construction too. Celia excelled ac academically and showed through her own experience the success women could achieve in this field. She had many friends and enjoyed surprising them with delicious Spanish dishes she cooked well. Among the university students, there was a popular video of Celia flipping a Spanish omelet into the air, adding butter to it mid-flip so it burst like a fireball. A trick she performed masterfully when requested by friends. In summer 2018, Celia returned to Spain to spend time with her family, but came back to Iowa later to graduate. The promising athlete was part of the Iowa State women's golf team and also competed individually. She was preparing for an upcoming competition but unfortunately, these plans never came to fruition. The assassin was already on the lookout for a victim and preparing for an attack when Celia arrived at the golf club on September 17, 2018. She had just finished a conversation with her mother. The staff, familiar with the notable athlete, informed her that 15 older gentlemen from Des Moines had also arrived and were scheduled to play golf at 8.45. The group was directed to the starting line where the first four holes were located. Celia watched them arrive in golf carts and begin their game. A collection of retirees indicated to her to advance and begin her round. Celia complied using her cart to play the first hole, then advancing directly to number four so as not to delay the senior group. 
the seniors described her as both polite and friendly. Celia then proceeded toward the seventh hole, an area less frequented due to its distance from other holes and its border with Squawk Creek Park, which was known for its dense vegetation. Athletes generally avoided this area as it could sometimes host unauthorized visitors and even aggressive homeless individuals. Unfamiliar with these local nuances, she ventured there nonetheless. Players needing to reach the ninth hole had to cross a bridge via a wide path and navigate through a section of woods. One coach remarked that this area felt quite eerie, akin to Sleepy Hollow. Celia was headed that way later in the morning. Around 10.30 a.m., a group of 15 people approached this location and saw Celia's cart with her belongings still in place, but Celia herself was nowhere in sight. While playing on the field, they noted something unusual. Celia hadn't appeared within 10 minutes, causing concern among the group. Deciding to investigate further, they approached her cart and sought out any sign of Celia. As they drew nearer, they observed her t-shirt, baseball cap, and various personal items scattered in the field. Her phone remained on the cart. It seemed as though some items might have accidentally fallen from her pocket. However, why her t-shirt was lying around and why she had abandoned her phone remained unclear. They searched around, but there was no one in. Next, they the club management and reported the troubling discovery. The group mentioned they'd seen a pretty blonde girl playing golf earlier, but now she was gone and her stuff was still there. The staff who arrived recognized it was Celia and started looking for her. In less than half an hour, they found a body floating in the pond near the ninth hole. That's when called the police. Once they retrieved the body from the water, officers identified her. It was Celia Barkin, the reigning European champion. Celia had been stabbed several times in both the neck and torso. A search dog immediately picked up a trail and led officers to a tent in a wooded area of Squawk Creek Park. However, the tent was empty with blood inside. The police thought a homeless man might have attacked Celia and began searching for him. Just as they were searching near the tent, a man approached them saying he lived there and wanted to get his tent. His name was Colin Richards. He was also 22 years old like Celia, but their lives were worlds apart. Officers quickly realized he might be involved in the murder. His face was scratched up. Inside his black backpack, they found bloody clothes, a t-shirt and shorts along with clean clothes he had changed into. The search dogs even reacted to his scent. Richards had a deep wound on his left arm that was bleeding. He tried hiding it from officers. Based on this evidence, Colin Richards was taken into custody by police. According to him, before law enforcement arrived, he'd been at a friend's house. Two male friends had brought him back to the park to get his tent, and when he got there, he saw police. Richards denied any involvement in the crime and stated he had never met Celia. He claimed the scratches on his face were from branches encountered while walking through wooded areas. Colin was already known to police due to his abuse of illegal substances, alcohol, and mental health problems. He became after he was released from prison, three months prior to the murder. Colin had served about seven months in jail for burglary and had previously been convicted several times for offenses, demonstrating a long history of legal troubles. Growing up in a dysfunctional family, Colin had been familiar to law enforcement since his teenage years. Detectives interviewed three men who were acquaintances of Colin. One of the homeless men shared a tent with him, while the other two provided him a ride from his home to the park. The owner of the house allowed Colin to wash and change his clothes because he was disheveled, covered in mud, blood, sand, and water. After cleaning up and changing clothes, Colin left with his bloody garments in a black backpack to run to the park for his tent. According to these men, Colin was acting unusually that day, extremely nervous and in a hurry. He did not explain why he needed to leave so suddenly, but merely said he had badly cut himself and soiled his clothes. Another homeless man living with him mentioned that Colin always carried a serrated knife used for domestic purposes. Just a day before the murder, Colin had expressed a desire to rape and kill someone. However, this statement wasn't taken seriously by his friend. Consequently, 
Colin was charged with first-degree murder immediately after Celia's body was discovered. Investigators believed the crime was premeditated. They thought he planned to kill someone and was actively searching for a victim that day. The judge set bail at $5 million. However, lacking such funds, Colin remained in custody awaiting trial. Meanwhile, Celia's family in Spain remained unaware of these tragic events, but grew increasingly worried as she hadn't returned their calls or messages. Police officers alongside Ames tried reaching out to their colleagues in Point San Miguel and embassy personnel in Madrid to inform Celia's family about the terrible news. However, since it was past midnight in Spain, there was no one available at work or answering the phone. The coach had to make the most difficult phone call of his life. After several hours with no updates, the parents learned that their daughter had been brutally. Later, a serrated knife was discovered in a wooded area containing fingerprints and DNA of the homeless man. Additionally, blood under the victim's fingernails contained particles of Colin's skin, demonstrating that these scratches were inflicted by the deceased rather than by branches. Initially, the homeless man denied any guilt. However, under pressure from substantial evidence, he confessed to his actions. He stated that he had consumed substances that day and was not thinking clearly. While walking through the woods, he saw a young girl who was alone and decided she would be an easy target. Colin had never met or known her before. Celia was an unfortunate victim of his violent attack. Iowa abolished the death penalty in 1965. Thus, he faced a maximum sentence of life imprisonment without parole. At his trial, Colin's family provided an account of his life. His parents were never married or living together when he was born. For the first 10 years of his life, Colin lived with his father, who raised him strictly and often sent him to bed alone while frequenting bars himself. His grandparents cared for him during this period until his mother contested custody and brought him to live with her after marrying another man and having two more children. They resided in the countryside because it seemed more peaceful there. The household maintained strict discipline and Colin's room was always spotless, a point which led family members to joke that he should join the army. Colin performed well academically, but began experiencing behavioral problems as a teenager after reconnecting with his alcoholic father. Despite attempts by his father to re-educate him, Colin did not heed advice and was ultimately kicked out of their home at age 15. From there, he joined poor company, dropped out of school, and became addicted to alcohol as well as other substances. When Colin was 18, he had a girlfriend who was twice his age. In May 2015, he was arrested for domestic violence, her. He was found and sentenced to 60 days in jail. Another time, when was accused of shoplifting, he threatened to return and shoot up the place. Cole's life spiraled out of control, but no one seemed to notice. In the two years that followed the domestic violence case, he was repeatedly arrested for theft, harassment, and attempted burglary. He was sent to undergo behavioral intervention courses, which didn't help. In November 2017, Colin was incarcerated at Mount Pleasant Correctional Facility for two years for burglary, as well as a probation violation. Despite disciplinary problems, including fights with other inmates, he was released on parole after just seven months in June 2018 because the prison was running out of space. Only three months later, he killed Celia. After leaving prison, Colin was met by his mother and stepfather with whom he lived. They resumed their relationship and corresponded while Colin was behind bars. His parents believed in him and gave him a chance for a normal life. Taking his word that he would not use illegal substances and cease communicating with old friends from bad company. However, two weeks later, he was kicked out of his home for not keeping his promise. Colin headed to Ames, which was an hour away from his home. For a while, he found refuge in the city's only homeless shelter, but there weren't enough beds. He asked his mother for help and she bought him a tent. In his new city, Colin quickly came to the attention of the Ames Police Department. On June 29th, he was arrested for public drunkenness. On August 11th, police received a complaint from a Target store 
that Colin and another homeless man were camping in an open lot behind the store and were chased away. They then camped in Squawk Creek Park so as not to disturb anyone else. Colin stated that the police permitted them to camp there, but this is contradicted by the police, who assert that overnight camping in the park is prohibited and no one advised him to break the law. On September 2nd, just 15 days before Celia's murder, police responded to a call at Burger where Colin had threatened customers with his knife. Despite this, he was released. On September 8th, his mother and stepfather came to Ames to celebrate Colin's 22nd birthday. They took him to dinner and then to the laundromat to wash his clothes. His mother was concerned about his behavior. Colin was uncommunicative and distant, giving brief one-word responses to their questions. After they dropped him off at a tent in the park where he was living with another homeless man, they drove home. At that point, Colin confessed to his friend that he wanted to rape and kill a woman. Tragically, Celia was found dead the next morning, though she had not been raped. Police believe he did not have enough time. Colin's parents said it was his own fault. They tried to help him but could not change his path. Consequently, Colin received a life sentence without parole on August 23, 2019. He's currently serving his sentence at Story County Jail in Nevada, Iowa. The entire town of Ames mourned Celia's death. Thousands gathered for a candlelight ceremony to honor the talented athlete. Her family was devastated by the news of her murder and outraged that someone who had achieved nothing and aspired to nothing had so cruelly taken her life. Colin showed no regard for Celia's life. He chose her randomly and killed her because of a violent impulse. The family of the deceased found some solace in the verdict and were relieved that the perpetrator was apprehended quickly and prevented from harming anyone else again. They only wished they hadn't let their daughter go so far away, even though it was her dream. Statistically, the U.S. is not safe. The per capita murder rate in the U.S. is 26 times higher than in Spain. In their small town in Spain, the last murder was 100 years ago. All to blame, the family believes, is the widespread availability of illegal substances, which are literally at every turn. This has led to an increase in violence. Her parents have kept Celia's room exactly as she left it, with one notable addition, an engineering degree posthumously awarded by the state of Iowa. They often stroll through the local golf club and remember when their daughter took her first steps in the sport. Here, the community of Ames, including the university administration and students, were outraged by this crime. Particularly concerning was that the golf course bordered a wooded area and had no fencing. As a result of this negligence by the golf club, the girl's life was put in danger. This was not the first murder case in that neighborhood. Back in 2008, there was a stabbing incident where one man was killed and a homeless assailant was found guilty of murder. It remains unknown if measures were subsequently taken by the golf club to ensure player safety on holes 7 and N. After Celia's death, her boyfriend Carlos could not stay in a city where everything reminded him of her. Carlos moved to Florida and his further fate is unknown. Celia's brother experienced considerable stress following her death and lost significant weight. After receiving a law degree, he decided to join the police force to help others, a path encouraged by his sister, who had always hinted at his purpose in life. On March 19, 2014, an emergency call was made to the police in Guamuchil, located in the state of Sinaloa, Mexico. The caller's voice was broken and pleading for help for his daughter. Officers rushed to a house in the Las Fuentes area. When they arrived, they saw the front doors wide open. Inside, upstairs, they found a man and his younger daughter, who was about 10 years, both crying inconsolably. The man led the police to a room where they found the lifeless body of a 16-year-old girl with over 60 wounds. This tragic news spread quickly through the city and shocked its residents. Nobody could comprehend who could take the life of such a young girl. Anel Bez Alvarez was born on March 17, 1998, in Guamuchil, Sinaloa. She was the second child of Idalia Alvarez and Hugo Bays. Her older brother was Omar. Later, they were joined by their younger sibling, Aide. 
During her childhood, Anel faced no particular problems. Although initially reserved, she grew to be self-assured with grace and charm. Her father worked as a tailor, and the family enjoyed prosperity and closeness. However, this happiness ended when Anel's mother was diagnosed with cancer in the early 2010s. The children had to mature quickly to care for her. Following a tough battle with illness, Idalia passed away in 2012. The family was devastated but did not waver. They supported each other through grief and tried to make life as comfortable as possible. The tragedy brought Anel closer to her sister. They shared everything, both sadness and difficulties, together. Despite these challenges, Anel remained cheerful and friendly with a passion for dancing and music. As she transitioned to high school, she emerged as an ideal daughter, managing household chores, looking after her younger sister, and maintaining good grades. One of her favorite activities was cooking for her family. Her desserts were especially popular. Anel also overcame shyness and became one of the most well-liked girls in school. She even formed a musical group where she took on the role of a singer, developing a fondness for the ballad Amor Eterno. Around the same time, Anel met someone who would become her best friend, at least for a while. Her name was Andy Elizabeth Gutierrez. They became an inseparable duo, drawing admiration from everyone around and being considered the most popular girls in school. They their bond through social media posts. On October 14, 2012, Anel uploaded a photo with Andy expressing her joy about their friendship. She expressed gratitude to God for the opportunity to be close to her, and even wrote that Andy had become not just a friend, but a sister to her. For a while, everything was wonderful, but over time, things changed. Despite being the same age, their personalities turned out to be completely different. Anel was a sweet girl who loved love songs and spending time with her family. Meanwhile, Andy lived in an unstable environment and became increasingly involved in what was known as narco culture. This urban community was also known in Mexico as Buchona. Andy was consistently present at events featuring musicians of this kind, such as the concert of the band Caliber 50 during the closing of the carnival celebrations in Guamachil in 2014. The girl also held very clear political stances. On one occasion, she shared on her social media that she participated in a march supporting Joaquin El Chapo Guzman Loera. On her social media page, she wrote, March for the liberation of El Chapo. We must join this great cause, which was accompanied by a photo. Unlike her friend, Anel typically didn't express her ideology on social media and didn't share the views supported by Andy. As a result, the distance between them grew larger. In 2014, both entered Guamachil High School at the Autonomous University of Sinaloa, but hardly communicated with each other. Each created her own group of friends. Anel started hanging out with Melissa Carey Manuel and Maria Jose, friends who led similar lifestyles to hers and followed her everywhere and admired her deeply. Maria Jose, who had known Anel since elementary school, considered Anel the mother of their entire group and assumed this role always taking care of everyone. Despite maintaining a polite and orderly demeanor, she kept her distance from Randy and never informed her father or siblings about their dispute. Around this time, Randy's social media behavior became erratic. On her page, she started posting negative and troubling messages. For instance, some posts were highly alarming, mentioning things like pregnant 13-year-old girls and year-old girls taking active substances. Other posts were quite disturbing, such as, my mom is upset that I killed my ex and buried him in my garden, or, lucky the living dead she is envied. Initially, these posts seemed nonsensical. Randy often drew them from forums or songs. However, over time, her messages began to take on a more threatening tone. On February 5th, 2014, she wrote, I'm going to bury you by the end of this year. Then, on February 23rd of the same month, she posted, I may seem very calm, but in my head I've killed you at least three times, and in the end, my mind is filled with new ideas every day. A few days later, Randy wrote, Thank God no one hears my thoughts and everything will definitely happen tomorrow. The unsettling messages continued to appear with increasing frequency. On March 3rd, she posted, 
Maybe not now and not tomorrow, but soon. I assure you I won't tell her anything then, but know that I have already mentally destroyed you. The last post was dated March 16th. She wrote, This seriously drives me to despair. No one within her social circle knew who the threats were aimed at. However, rumors began circulating at school. Many speculated that Randy was upset with Anel because they were no longer friends. Some even accused Randy of being jealous of Anel since everyone adored her. Despite this turmoil, Anel appeared unfazed by what Randy was posting on social media. Anel celebrated her birthday with a large party where she wore a beautiful pink dress and was undoubtedly the star of the evening. Everything in her life seemed perfect until her unexpected absence on March 19th raised concerns among her family. Hugo received a call from the school attended by his younger daughter, informing him that Anel had not come to pick her up as usual. Initially, Hugo wasn't overly concerned. He thought Anel might have overslept or was with friends. After school, he went to pick up his daughter. The way, Hugo decided to call Anel to ensure everything was okay, but she didn't answer. He assumed she was still sleeping. After picking his daughter, Hugo tried to contact Anel again. She didn't respond. He repeatedly called her number with no success, and his worry deepened. Hugo headed home in the Los Fuentes area. Upon arriving, he noticed that the front door was wide open. Entering the main living room, father and daughter saw that some items had been moved. They thought it might have been a robbery. They shouted Anel's name and searched for her throughout the house. She did not respond and couldn't be found anywhere. Finally, Hugo reached her room. He tried to open the door, but it was locked, raising his concern further. He knocked several times without getting a response from Anel. Hugo then broke down the door. What he saw took his breath away. Anel's lifeless body lay on the floor with numerous wounds and blood stains around her. He immediately called the police, who soon arrived at the scene. Seeing the crime scene, officers initially thought that a very strong person or group had committed the crime. Although there were blood stains in the room, they were minimal. It was evident someone had tried to clean them up. Later during the autopsy, the forensic expert determined that Anel had sustained 65 stab wounds in total. Officers were convinced that this attack was carried out by someone harboring strong hatred toward her. Moreover, since neither doors nor windows were forced open, detectives believed Anel knew her assailant and let them into the house willingly. They speculated she might have arranged to meet with this person that day. However, upon checking her mobile phone, they found nothing suggesting such an arrangement. No invitations or planned visits were evident on her phone records. Initially, Hugo wasn't too concerned. He figured Anel might have overslept or was with friends. After school, he went to pick up his daughter. The way, Hugo decided to call Anel just to check in, but there was no answer. Thought she might still be sleeping. After picking up his daughter, he tried contacting Anel again, but there was still no response. Hugo called repeatedly with no success. His concern grew. Heading home to their place in Las Fuentes, he noticed the front door was wide open. Inside, some items had been moved around. It looked like a robbery might have taken place. Father and daughter started calling out for Anel and searched the house frantically. There was no response from her and she wasn't anywhere to be found. When Hugo reached her room, he found the door locked, which raised his alarm even more. He knocked several times without any reply. Eventually, Hugo broke down the door. What he saw left him breathless. Anel's lifeless body lay on the floor with multiple wounds and blood stains nearby. He immediately called the police who arrived promptly at the scene. Observing the crime scene initially led officers to think that someone very strong or possibly a group had committed the crime. Although there were blood stains in the room, minimal ones, it appeared that an attempt had been made to clean them up. Later during the autopsy, a forensic expert determined that Anel had sustained 65 stab wounds. Officers began believing that someone with intense hatred towards her carried out the attack. There were no signs of forced entry. Doors and windows remained intact, suggesting that Anel knew her assailant and let them in willingly. They even speculated whether she had arranged to meet someone that day. 
However, upon checking her mobile phone records, they found nothing indicating an invite to anyone to her home that day. It appeared to be a random encounter since there were no surveillance cameras in the vicinity. Officers decided to interview the neighbors. A few of them reported seeing a slender girl with black hair leaving the house. These statements helped narrow down the pool of suspects, and investigators were no longer looking for a man or a group of people. Following this, officers began questioning Anel's close circle. All relatives had solid alibis, asserting that the girl had no enemies, was very friendly, and they couldn't imagine anyone wishing her harm. However, Detectives took an interest in a post on Randy's social media in which she expressed shock at Anel's death. Some people conveyed their condolences, but others started pointing fingers at Randy as the murderer. They flooded the post with comments accusing her and claiming she was guilty of the crime. Randy deleted her account, but it was already too late. Police called several of Anel's friends to ask about the connection between the two girls. All of them mentioned that they had grown apart, and it was evident that Randy envied Anel because she was more popular. After these interviews, detectives visited Randy's social media profiles and found numerous threatening posts she had written a few months earlier. But that wasn't all. Just hours after Anel's death, Randy wrote, I'm a fool. Oh my God, what have I done? Although these posts lacked context, Everything pointed to Randy as the primary suspect in the crime. This information was kept confidential because officers feared she might flee before they could apprehend her. The agents patiently waited for the right moment. The case drew so much attention that hundreds of people gathered at a well-known funeral home in Guamamuil to bid farewell to Anel. Friends, relatives, teachers, and classmates cried and embraced each other, unable to believe such a young girl had left life behind. Despite the large crowd, two people stood out with their presence. As soon as the girls entered the room, they began chatting and eating ice cream. A few minutes later, Andy suggested watching a movie. She then mentioned she was going to the bathroom, asked them not to pause the movie. However, instead of going to the bathroom, Andy went downstairs to the kitchen. She picked up a sharp knife and returned to the room, concealing it under her clothes. She noticed that Nell was lying on the bed with her back to the door. Seizing this opportunity, Andy took out the knife and started attacking her. Nell attempted to defend herself by scratching, pushing and punching, but couldn't overpower Andy. Nell lost too much blood and eventually fell lifeless to the floor, becoming a victim of a heinous crime. Andy began showing signs of impatience, aware that she needed to act quickly as Nell's family would return home soon. She used all available rags to try cleaning up the blood, but could only manage to wipe away part of it due to its large amount. Eventually, she went to the bathroom, washed her hands, and put on clothes taken from Nell's wardrobe. Afterward, she closed the door to the room leaving her best friend's body inside and ran out of the house, leaving the front door ajar. When Nell's relatives heard this account, they became furious. They knew that the story about the photograph was a lie. Anel was not capable of such an act. It didn't align with her character. Furthermore, Anel's friends claimed they had never seen that photograph before. They noted that since both girls were so popular, it would have been impossible for such a photo not to have spread and someone would have surely downloaded it by now. All signs pointed toward envy as being the actual motive for this crime. However, at this point in time, motive no longer mattered because Andy had become the sole suspect in this crime and was officially charged with involuntary manslaughter. The legal proceedings moved swiftly. Four officers escorted Andy into juvenile court proceedings at prosecutor's offices specializing in cases involving minors. After an hour and a half hearing session took place, Andy was found guilty. Although it was clear that she had devised a premeditated plan and the murder was intentional, given that she was six years old, she received sentence of seven years imprisonment. She was transferred to the juvenile detention center in Kakan Anel's family believed justice had been achieved and thought was done. However, they were gravely mistaken. The defense filed an appeal, arguing that the trial took place in Kakan, 
which was incorrect since the crime occurred within Los Mochis's jurisdiction. The higher court decided to reopen the trial, this time in the proper jurisdiction. Despite the swift process, the verdict remained unchanged. This decision sparked widespread outrage among the public. Hundreds of Mexicans and foreigners shared images on social media with posters calling for justice for Anel. Several polls were conducted with over 5 million users believing Arend's sentence was unjust. Many felt she deserved a much longer prison term. The trial took place again, and once more, the girl received a seven-year imprisonment sentence. Hugo addressed journalists expressing his dissatisfaction. He appreciated that the sentence wasn't reduced, but felt Randy's age shouldn't have shielded her from a longer term. He hoped she would at least serve the full sentence, but even that didn't happen. On July 6, 2016, her sentence got reduced to five years of imprisonment. Moreover, it was also decided at this hearing that with good behavior, she could be released earlier. State police officers had to close the courthouse gates as numerous journalists wanted photographs of her. This case became one of the most high profile in the country. Hugo wasn't informed about this hearing, which caused him significant outrage, and from this point onward, circumstances became even worse. On Friday, September 23, 2017, another hearing analyzed Ari's behavior in connection with reforms in federal juvenile justice law. The girl was released after serving only three and a half years out of her initial sentence. Leaving court, Hugo expressed extreme dissatisfaction. He felt he had witnessed a great injustice. He regretted that legislative reforms appeared to benefit offenders rather than victims. In the somber confines of the courtroom, Menhaz Zaman stood before the judge, his voice trembling with remorse as he expressed the depths of his regret for the irreparable harm he had caused. With heavy hearts, he sought forgiveness from all those he had wronged, especially those who had lost loved ones as a result of his unforgivable actions. Acknowledging the profound damage inflicted upon his family and the wider community, Menhaz bowed his head in shame, unable to escape the weight of his guilt. November 2020 marked the fateful moment when Menhaz's fate was sealed with a life sentence, condemning him to spend the next four decades behind bars. At the tender age of 24, he was stripped of his freedom, serving time for the deaths of four individuals who had once been dear to him his father, Manur, taken at 59, his mother, Momotaz, at 50, his grandmother at 70, and his sister, tragically gone at the tender age of 21. Despite the sacrifices made for his well-being, Menhaz's actions had brought nothing but devastation upon his family. As he languished in the confines of his prison cell, Menhaz grappled with the emptiness and loneliness that engulfed his once vibrant life. Cut off from the virtual world he had once sought solace in, he was forced to confront the gravity of his prolonged deception. In the quiet solitude of his confinement, he reflected on the twisted web of lies he had spun to maintain his facade, the weight of his deception bearing down upon him like a leaden burden. The truth of Menhaz's deception came to light as he stood trial, each revelation serving as a painful reminder of the betrayal and deceit that had torn his family apart. The Zan family, once united in love and solidarity, now faced the harsh reality of their shattered lives, haunted by the knowledge that their own flesh and blood had been responsible for their unimaginable loss. In the end, as Menhaz faced the consequences of his actions, he could only hope that his remorse would serve as a meager consolation to those he had wronged. But as the doors of his prison cell closed behind him, he knew that no amount of regret could ever undo the irreparable damage he had wrought upon the lives of those he held most dear. As the fake graduation date of July 28th drew near, Menhaz's behavior took a disturbing turn. Seemingly unraveling before the eyes of those around him, he adopted the persona of a lost soul, referring to himself as a subhuman unworthy of life. Dark jokes about suicide peppered his conversations, revealing the depths of his despair. But who was this troubled individual? Menhaz Zaman, a young Canadian with a promising future, appeared to be living the dream as a mechanical engineering student at York University. However, the truth was far from what it seemed. In reality, Menhaz had never set foot on the university campus. 
Concealing this fact from his parents, he plunged deeper into a world of deceit, fabricating elaborate tales to maintain his facade of academic success. Each passing year brought new challenges as he struggled to uphold his double life, the pressure mounting as graduation loomed on the horizon. The strain took its toll on Menhaz's mental well-being, pushing him to the brink of desperation. In a desperate bid for attention, Menhaz resorted to unthinkable measures. On that fateful day, he committed the ultimate act of betrayal, snuffing out the lives of his own family members in a chilling display of violence. Posting photos of his heinous crime on his Discord channel, he sought to shock and horrify, drawing the gaze of a horrified audience. While some initially dismissed his actions as a tasteless prank, the grim reality soon became undeniable. Despite Menhaz's efforts to conceal his identity, the truth of his origins lay in a land far from the bustling streets of Toronto. Born from the complex tapestry of Bangladesh, his family had harbored dreams of a better life in the promise of a new beginning. Manyo Zan, his father, and Momas, his mother, had embarked on a journey of hope, leaving behind their homeland to seek their fortune in Canada. Their arrival in Toronto marked the beginning of a new chapter, filled with aspirations for a brighter future. With the birth of Menhaz and later Mesa, they endeavored to create a loving and nurturing environment for their children. Momas, in particular, was hailed as a beacon of kindness and generosity, her unwavering support a source of strength for the family and the broader Bangladeshi immigrant community. Yet, beneath the veneer of normalcy lay a web of secrets and lies, woven by Menhaz in his relentless pursuit of acceptance and validation. The tragic events that unfolded would serve as a stark reminder of the fragility of the human psyche and the devastating consequences of unchecked deception. And as Menhaz's dark descent came to light, the world could only watch in horror, grappling with the incomprehensible depths of his betrayal. Moni Roos, husband to Momotaz, possessed a quiet demeanor that belied his deep sense of pride and devotion to his family. Known as an introvert within the neighborhood, he commanded respect through his modesty and unwavering dedication. A devout Muslim, Moni placed his family above all else, embodying the values of faith and integrity in his daily life. For years, he toiled as a taxi driver, his commitment to his profession earning him recognition as one of the finest in the city. Having relocated to the bustling metropolis in pursuit of a better life, Moni and Momotaz harbored lofty ambitions for their children. Mesa and Menhaz, the apples of their parents' eyes, were envisioned as future pillars of success destined for lucrative careers that would afford them comfort and prosperity. Despite their own humble beginnings, Moni and Momotaz were determined to provide their offspring with every opportunity for advancement, sparing no effort in their quest for success. Their journey towards prosperity began modestly with the purchase of a humble abode on Mawin Road in Scarborough. Through prudent financial planning and astute investments, they soon expanded their portfolio acquiring two additional properties in the same area and a house nearby in Danforth. Momotaz assumed the role of property manager, overseeing their growing assets with precision and care. As the family's fortunes continued to ascend, so too did Momotaz's sense of responsibility towards her children and their burgeoning real estate empire. Recognizing the need for support, her mother Fosa made the journey from India to lend a helping hand. With her assistance, Momotaz found equilibrium between her professional endeavors and personal life, ensuring that both flourished in tandem. In 2006, they embarked on a significant investment, purchasing a spacious four-bedroom house in the neighboring town of Markham. This move symbolized their aspirations for a brighter future, aligning with the widely held belief that success in life hinged on careers in medicine or engineering. Mesa harbored dreams of becoming a neurosurgeon, while Menhaz was earmarked for a career in engineering, in line with his parents' hopes and aspirations. However, the path to success proved arduous, fraught with challenges and unforeseen obstacles. Melissa, their eldest daughter, rebelled against their expectations, often veering off course with reckless behavior. Her defiance strained the familial bonds, leading to conflicts that spilled beyond the confines of their home and attracted the unwanted attention of law enforcement. Despite their best efforts, 
Moni and Momotaz struggled to rein in Melissa's wayward tendencies, her actions casting a shadow over the family's aspirations. In stark contrast, Menhaz exuded a quiet and reserved demeanor, forging a close bond with his mother, Momotaz. She doted on him, fulfilling his every need and desire, showering him with love and attention. Menhaz, the eldest son, felt the weight of his parents' expectations bearing down on him, driving him to excel and meet their lofty standards. Yet, beneath the facade of familial harmony, Menhaz sought solace in the virtual realm of online gaming, immersing himself in virtual worlds where he found refuge from the pressures of reality. His fascination with MMO games like Perfect World provided an escape from the rigors of everyday life, offering a platform for self-expression and social interaction. While his peers pursued academic endeavors, Menhaz retreated further into the confines of his room, spending hours on end immersed in online gaming communities. Despite the facade of academic success, Menhaz grappled with a sense of inadequacy and the burden of unmet expectations. Upon receiving news of his acceptance into the mechanical engineering program at York University, Menhaz's achievement was hailed as a triumph, further cementing his status as the family's favored child. Yet, beneath the veneer of success lay a mounting pressure to prove himself worthy of their adulation. With each passing day, the weight of expectations bore down on Menhaz, driving him further into the depths of his virtual refuge. As the weight of expectations mounted, Menhaz retreated further into the virtual realm, seeking solace in the digital landscapes of online gaming. Venturing into an enhanced version of the perfect world game, he found camaraderie among fellow players, forging connections within the confines of this virtual community. Through the popular social network Discord, Menhaz maintained contact with friends and acquaintances, finding a sense of belonging that eluded him in the real world. Within the game, Menhaz shed the constraints of his shy and reserved persona, embracing his true self in a space where authenticity thrived. Here, amidst the pixels and avatars, he felt liberated from the burdens of reality, free to express himself without fear of judgment or censure. The supportive atmosphere fostered friendships that transcended the boundaries of the game, providing Menhaz with a sense of belonging that he struggled to find elsewhere. Meanwhile, Melissa's rebellion continued unabated, her defiance a constant source of tension within the family home. Despite their efforts to rein her in, her actions only served to exacerbate the already strained atmosphere. Her departure from home did little to alleviate the palpable tension leaving a void that Menhaz sought to fill with his virtual escapades. In the eyes of their parents, Menhaz emerged as the beacon of hope, the embodiment of their aspirations for a brighter future. They boasted of his supposed acceptance into York University's prestigious engineering program, basking in the imagined glory of his academic achievements. However, beneath the facade of parental pride lay a web of deception as Menhaz's purported success crumbled under scrutiny. In reality, Menhaz's academic journey took a different trajectory, far removed from the lofty heights his parents envisioned. Instead of York University, he found himself enrolled in the less prestigious confines of Seneca Community College, his dreams of academic success shattered. Struggling to keep pace with his studies, he grappled with feelings of loneliness and disillusionment, his sense of identity eroded by the weight of unmet expectations. Frustrated by the suffocating grip of parental control, Menhaz rebelled against the constraints imposed upon him, casting aside the religious beliefs that once anchored him. His disillusionment only deepened as he confronted the stark reality of his circumstances, grappling with a sense of betrayal and abandonment. Amidst the wreckage of broken dreams, Menhaz sought solace in the virtual embrace of online gaming, the only refuge left in a world fraught with disappointment and deceit. Despite his tumultuous relationships and mounting academic struggles, Menhaz sought solace and independence through his online interactions. His burgeoning romance with a girl he met on the internet only served to stoke his parents' disapproval and exacerbate his frustration. Nevertheless, Menhaz remained determined to assert his autonomy, finding refuge in the immersive world of Perfect World and the vibrant Discord community. Initially, Menhaz managed to maintain a facade of academic diligence, but as his obsession with gaming intensified, his grades suffered a precipitous decline. 
His once promising academic career spiraled into chaos as he began skipping classes and neglecting his studies altogether. Despite his academic freefall, Menhas managed to conceal the extent of his academic failures from his unsuspecting parents, who remained oblivious to his academic woes. Each day, Menhas embarked on a carefully orchestrated parade, leaving home ostensibly to attend classes at York University. In reality, he spent his days ensconced in a local cafe, engrossed in his virtual pursuits. From there, he would make a cursory visit to the gym before returning to his online haven, where he whiled away the hours until the late hours of the night. Menhaz's online persona belied the darkness that consumed him, as he frequently joked with his virtual companions about his impending incarceration and his impending departure from their midst. However, beneath the veneer of levity, his humor took on a sinister edge, laced with aggression and hostility. His increasingly provocative remarks drew ire from community members, culminating in his eventual banishment from the platform. Despite the mounting concerns surrounding Menhaz's behavior, his online associates dismissed his antics as mere attention-seeking, failing to recognize the depths of his isolation and despair. As Menhaz retreated further into his virtual cocoon, Melissa sought to forge her own path, severing ties with her family and pursuing her academic aspirations at York University. From the outside, the Zaman family appeared to be on the cusp of a new chapter filled with promise and potential. Yet, unbeknownst to them, Menhaz's descent into darkness would soon shatter the illusion of familial harmony, leaving a trail of devastation in its wake. On July 27, 2019, the Zaman household buzzed with the usual activity, unaware of the tragedy about to unfold. Menhaz, calculating and methodical, seized the opportunity to set his sinister plan into motion. With chilling composure, he crept into his mother's bedroom, armed with a crowbar. In a swift and brutal assault, he rendered her unconscious with a single blow to the head before mercilessly slitting her throat. The scene of carnage was soon replicated as Menhaz turned his attention to his unsuspecting grandmother, dispatching her with the same ruthless efficiency. Having executed his heinous acts, Menhaz retreated to the confines of his room, his facade of normalcy now shattered. With a sense of perverse satisfaction, he chronicled his atrocities on Discord, sharing grotesque images of his victims' mutilated bodies alongside the implements of his depravity. To some, accustomed to Menhaz's macabre sense of humor, the ghastly display seemed like another tasteless joke. However, for those unaccustomed to such dark behavior, it sparked genuine alarm and disbelief. As the gravity of Menhaz's actions began to dawn on his online acquaintances, panic ensued. The realization that a potential spree of violence was unfolding in real time left them feeling helpless and powerless to intervene. Desperate to prevent further bloodshed, they frantically scrambled to identify the perpetrator, but Menhaz had meticulously concealed his identity, leaving them grasping at straws. Amidst the chaos, Junior, a close friend of Menhaz, found himself bombarded with inquiries from concerned users seeking insight into his friend's motives. Driven by a sense of urgency, Junior confronted Menhaz, seeking confirmation of the grim reality depicted in the disturbing images. Menhaz's chilling response confirmed their worst fears, revealing his intention to claim the lives of his remaining family members. Meanwhile, oblivious to the unfolding tragedy, Melissa returned home, greeted by an eerie silence that belied the horror lurking within. Unbeknownst to her, she had walked into a nightmare orchestrated by her own brother. As she ventured further into the house, she fell victim to the same brutal fate that had befallen her mother and grandmother, her life snuffed out by the hands of her own flesh and blood. In the aftermath of his sister's murder, Menhaz callously documented her demise, capturing her lifeless form in a macabre photograph. With chilling detachment, he shared the image with a friend named John, callously recounting the harrowing ordeal as if it were nothing more than a macabre spectacle to be observed and dissected. In a private message to John, Menhaz uttered words of self-condemnation, branding himself as a pathetic coward and a subhuman, consumed by a profound sense of shame and self-loathing. With a macabre sense of detachment, he proceeded to inundate John with a series of grisly photographs, each one more harrowing than the last. Among them was an image of the murder weapon, 
and even a disturbing selfie featuring Menhaz himself brandishing a bloodied knife, a grotesque testament to the depths of his depravity. Horrified by the gruesome evidence before him, John wasted no time in sharing these chilling images with the rest of the Discord group, each photo serving as damning proof of Menhaz's heinous crimes. As the community rallied to gather as much evidence as possible against him, Menhaz continued to play the part of the oblivious gamer, biding his time until his father's return. When Manure, Menhaz's father, unwittingly stepped into the trap laid by his own son, he fell victim to the same brutal fate that had befallen the rest of his family. With cold precision, Menhaz launched his final assault, stabbing his father in the neck before callously capturing the aftermath in yet another chilling photograph. In the wake of his heinous acts, Menhaz grappled with his own demons, acknowledging his cowardice and selfishness in a series of remorseful messages to his online acquaintances. Expressing a warped sense of resignation, he resigned himself to a life behind bars, inviting his friends to bear witness to the grim spectacle he had orchestrated. Amidst the chaos, one Discord user devised a plan to trace Menhaz's location through his IP address, a digital breadcrumb trail that led authorities straight to his doorstep. As the net closed in around him, Menhaz made no attempt to flee, choosing instead to confront the consequences of his actions head-on. Twelve agonizing hours after the bloodshed, law enforcement officers descended upon the Zaman residence, their suspicions confirmed by the sight of Menhaz peering down at them from his bedroom window. Surrendering himself to the authorities without resistance, Menhaz offered no protest as he was led away in handcuffs, his stoic demeanor betraying no hint of remorse or regret. Charged with multiple counts of first-degree murder, Menhaz stood trial as the weight of his crimes bore down upon him. With the damning evidence amassed by the online gaming community serving as irrefutable proof of his guilt, there remained little doubt as to his ultimate fate. In the end, justice prevailed, but the scars left behind by Menhaz's reign of terror would linger for years to come, a haunting reminder of the darkness that lurks within the human soul.